into the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your host, Lauren McClain. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining me on this beautiful day. Some of you may be camping outdoors a lot this summer, while others may prefer to stay inside with the comfort of the AC. <clears throat> That's me for sure. But I know there's a type of camp that we as BYU fans all love, and that is fall camp. BYU football fall camp starts next week, and we want to know all the hype. Later in the show, legendary BYU quarterback and current varsity club director Robbie Bosco talks to me about his experience at his first fall camp behind Jim McMahon and Steve Young, plus who he thinks is the must-watch for this year's camp. But first, let's welcome on Spencer Lintone. It's been too long, Spence. Hello, Lauren. I'm glad you pronounced <sighs> my name the appropriate way. Or not. <laughs> You want to call me Lintone? That's fine. I've known you so long, I can pronounce your name however I want. Yeah, exactly. So, Spence, fall camp starts next week for BYU football, and it's a time that we anticipate every year. It's the time the depth chart is sorted out, and we find out who will be leading the team to start the season. So, let's talk about why we do love fall camp so much. For you personally, Spencer, what makes you anticipate with eagerness this time of year? Well, obviously, just any time you have something taken away from you for a little while and football season (laughs) ends after the Super Bowl comes to a close some point in mid to the latter part of February, and then there's this long, dreary offseason of no football. Uh, Granted, you have the NFL draft and some other things, and then the transfer portal has come in, and so like college football has their own version of free agency that we've all been following, and then Conference realignment has helped us get through the summer, but still nothing beats the actual game, the competition, and once your team gets back together. And so just by nature of not having your football team together and battling for something, when they all come back into camp, it's like, all right, let's do this thing. And there's just a natural energy, natural hype that goes around that. And so, yeah, it's a very exciting time of year whenever those teams come back to training camp. Oh, can I just get on my soapbox here for a second? Why do we call it fall camp when it's in the summer? Why do we do that? It's still 100 degrees I've always wondered that. Yes, so can we just call it like late summer camp or training (laughs) camp? Well, you can't call it summer summer camp because then you think of like all these little kids going to – you know, jump in the lake off of the blob. I don't know. Let's just take the That's seasons what I think out of it. Summer camp. Let's take okay. the seasons camp. out of it and just football call camp. it football training camp for all yeah. the different teams. So, yes, there's a ton of excitement naturally after having no football, and now your teams are back for training camp. It is crazy that absence makes the heart grow fonder because there was a bad taste in our mouth at the end of last season, let's be honest, but – Every single year, year in, year out, it all goes away. Fall camp rolls around, and you are as excited as you were when when Steve Young was playing. It doesn't matter. I, I think the players and the coaches are excited. You get to hear about who's emerging after each practice, who's in, who's out, who's back from injury that's actually practicing. And, Spencer, you and I know there is something about the feel of fall camp. Like when you're able as the media to be led in, even though they're kind of just doing, you know, not much by that time that the media's let in. There's just such an awesome feel there. You, it's just the excitement of football about to start. And you've been to about a decade of fall camps. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, Spence. Decade? Yep. Yeah. In your career yeah. with BYU TV. What's the importance of fall camp from what you've seen? So I think it starts with the chemistry that is involved with a certain team, especially for teams that are welcoming in a bunch of new players. Like, this is their first opportunity to really mesh and and combine together. But then when you have a team that's full of veterans and have gone through a number of camps together, it it gets quicker, like the chemistry building, like the camaraderie and the natural feel. Sometimes it's already there on day one when you have veteran teams, which is why it's like, oh, man, that is such an advantage if you bring back a ton of veterans that have already done this. And so on day one, you're like, I know the drill. I know what I'm supposed to do. We've been having these player run practices over the summer. We've already established the chemistry and uh, we're used to each other. We know uh, how each other play, what we're going to do. Like we know the playbook well. And so that's where I feel like this specific BYU team is, is while there are a couple of key new parts It is primarily high-level veterans. We're talking about guys that are a part of the 11-win 2020 season, and then they came back and they went 6-1 and against seven Power 5 teams last year and won 10 games overall, even though 
that they slumped and at the end of the season and lost to UAB. Mm-hmm. But but regardless, this is the, like right. the primary core of these veterans have won 21 combined games over the last two seasons. And so they know the drill. Like they they know what's happening. And so for this specific BYU team going into training camp, it's it's more of like, all right, how fast can we get going? How quickly can we hit a, a high level of performance so that when the game for USF rolls around, and we're talking like essentially five weeks away from that first game, how quickly can we get to where we need to be game ready? And so I think this team under Kalani Satake is looking specifically for, okay, uh, can we get to that point in a week where we're just like, oh, yeah, we are a high-functioning machine? Or is it going to take the entirety of camp? I hope it doesn't, and I don't think it will right. based on who they bring back. So that's probably like the one thing that, that I'm thinking about in terms of like the importance of this fall camp for BYU specifically is how quickly can they get to that level that we expect them to be at by the time game one rolls around. Mm. And speaking of those veterans, usually – Aaron Rodgers has to do some tweaks to the offense according to who's coming back, who they have returning. But if you think about it, you mentioned all those veterans. They have a lot of the guys coming back. Jaron Hall, Gunnar Romney, Puka Nakua. The one guy they left that left right is Tyler Algier, but it sounds like Chris Brooks will be filling that spot really well. And so, Spencer, will there be very many tweaks that we're going to be seeing in the offense, or do you think it's going to be very similar to the offense we saw last year? Well, the base offense is going to remain the same. The tweaks that you bring up are more about little nuances to open up the playbook. So the playbook's just getting bigger, and you have that capability when you have a returning quarterback. Like, your ace in the hole is Jaron Hall behind that offensive line, and so because you have that core up front, now you can just expand the playbook and throw in those tweaks with new little trick plays, uh, and not necessarily trick plays, but just different formations. Um, so much about football and, and opening the playbook is uh, building your concept, yes, around that base offense, but now having so many different formations and different looks to confuse the defense while you're still trying to accomplish the same thing, right? Like right. you have a play that you think is going to get you a six- to seven-yard run, well, you've shown that before on film. How can we show a different formation but still essentially run the same play with just a different look? That That's the type of stuff you can do. Is you, your quarterback can, becomes more knowledgeable. He can move players into different positions. He can call for shifts and motions. And the defense is like, whoa, we haven't seen this on film. We haven't seen this. And now they're they're thinking, they're thinking, and the play is run. You get your seven yards. It's like, oh, wait, wasn't that just that play? But it looks so different. That Those are the type of nuances and tweaks that you're going to see from BYU football is uh, same base offense, but so many different formations and looks. And, yes, there will be some personnel differences with uh, some transfers. You brought brought up Chris Brooks. Houston Hamuli comes over as a fullback from Stanford. Um, How are they going to implement all of those different pieces um, to confuse defenses? That's the beauty of football. It's just smoke and mirrors. Like, what what are they going to do? I don't know. I haven't seen this look. I've been studying them all summer. I haven't seen this. (laughs) <laughs> that that's what fall camp allows you to do with veterans like that. And so, yeah, BYU is in a unique position, a uh, ton of veteran leadership, ton of NFL talent, we think uh, on this team, but mm-hmm. with that come really, really high expectations. And that's a little scary. That can be a little right. bit nerve wracking at, at times, but exciting. And I think Jaron Hall is, has such a good demeanor and, He's a little bit older. I think he's going to do phenomenally if he stays healthy, and that's one of the biggest questions. The offensive line, I think it really is as good as advertised, but we all know as BYU fans that the majority of seasons, the backup to the quarterback sees significant time during the season. So I want to know from you, Spencer, how confident are you in Jaron Hall's backups? Well, it's it's Jacob Conover at this point, we think. Like He appears to be the number two guy, and he saw some time in a meaningful game last year in Logan at Utah State when Jaron Hall was out with an already uh, discussed rib injury. Baylor Romney had been concussed earlier in the game, so out comes Jacob Conover, and they had to really, really go to a conservative part of the playbook. And can you imagine the nerves that Jacob Conover is feeling? Because BYU is a top-10 team. They're 4-0. They're in a hostile environment, a rivalry game at halftime. It's still hotly contested, right? He comes out, and he's got to run the offense, and they kind of just said, be the game manager. Let Tyler Algier on the offensive line and these guys carry it. They asked him to make a few throws, but we didn't really see what Jacob Conover is capable of, 
And right. I went to lunch with Max Hall a few weeks ago when I was visiting my brother in Arizona. And Max said, people are sleeping big time on Jacob Conover. Like they mm-hmm. don't, he is, there's something about that kid. He's just a gamer. So you give him full preparation. You make him the guy. You give him that confidence of being the guy and you will see what he is capable of. And so I I feel a little bit more confident in Jacob Conover and the other backups, Soljay Maiava Peters, Kate Fannigan. I probably feel a little bit more confident than the average BYU fan based on the conversations that I've had with Max right. and some of the BYU coaches about what it is that he can bring to the table when that switch is flipped, when you're like, okay, you're the guy. And uh, hopefully, I mean, heaven forbid, Jaron Hall has to sit out some games and he's had his own injury history. But if that's mm-hmm. the case, I'm I'm okay and, and confident enough in Jacob Conover to come in and lead an offense behind a really experienced offensive line. And he's got great weapons too that will, frankly, probably, if he has to play, will bail him out. You know, he mm. can throw a jump ball to Puka Nakua and Puka can make a play. Um, that the, He can hand the ball off to Christopher Brooks and Mason Wake and Lopini Katoa, all of those guys, because they've got experience. So he'll have weapons around him that will help him ease in if it comes to that. So, you know, I, I'm probably a little bit more confident than the average BYU fan. And hopefully he'll have a healthy Isaac Rex there at tight end as well. Sure. So, Yep, he has lots of lots of weapons, and that makes me feel a lot better. I trust Max Hall when it comes to quarterback. Spencer, thank you so much for coming on with me today, my friend. You are welcome. Here's to an undefeated season, Lauren. Let's go. <laughs> Get your blue goggles ready. Absolutely. Every year. Coming up, he's the only quarterback in BYU history to lead the Cougars to a national championship. Robbie Bosco joins me in studio up next on Cougar Tailgate. Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean. Robbie Bosco is the current director of the Varsity Club for BYU's Athletic Department. But for big-time BYU fans, you know him as the QB of BYU's National Championship squad and the quarterback's coach for the Cougars in the 90s, early 2000s. And because of that experience, Robbie knows a bit about fall camps. How would you describe what fall camp is like for a player? Because we as fans, we just get excited that they're going to be out there. It means the season's coming up. But what's the start of fall camp like for a player? Well, it's totally changed, Lauren, than when I played. When I played, we, were, we went two-a-days, mm. full pads, scrimmage probably almost every day, even if it was a little scrimmage. Now they have these rules where they hardly go in full pads. Wow. They're in helmets. They're in uh, shoulder pads and helmets. And it's much nicer on the body for sure yeah. and probably mentally too. So they, but they work hard and, uh, and they just, they're just ready to go. So it's kind of fun to watch them prepare for the season. You guys played through some crazy injuries back in the day. It, it, I mean, and it's probably, like you said, it's a good thing that it's changed, but what's it like for you kind of watching these players and you're like, oh, come on, you got to tough it out. Is that kind of weird? It is so, (laughs) it is funny. We laugh about it all the time because that, once again, that thing has totally changed. Back in the day, they kind of put a Band-Aid on it, and yeah. you went out there, and it didn't matter. Concussions. It's like they didn't know anything about right, concussions. Right, I guarantee I played with at least three concussions. Jeez. I remember walking off in the pit game, having to call timeout because I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. I was slurring the words, and they gave me some smelling salt. I, <laughs> I went back really? in the next play. And Give you a little slap in the behind. Let's and go. go in. You can do it. And so, you know, now they're just more cautious about stuff. And it's probably better. It's, right. Football is such a hard-nosed, yeah. tough game. I'm really glad it, it got to this point yeah. because it, it's just – there's injuries as it is. Right. And if you're out there playing injured, it just makes it too hard and it makes it more of a brutal game. Seems like you've been lucky though. You seem like you're in pretty good shape. You're doing all right. Do you, do you feel it still a little bit from time to time? Um, that's why I only golf and play with the grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else yeah. I don't do because but I actually I'm I'm came out of it pretty good and I feel good and stuff like that. I got some back issues and some joint issues, but you know, I'm getting older too, so. Right. 
1981 was your first year on campus. Jim McMahon was the starting quarterback. Steve Young was in the quarterback room. What do you remember most about that quarterback room from 1981? Oh, boy, how the confidence of Jim McMahon. I mean, it was, you know, here I am. I'm, I come in these meetings. I'm like, I want to learn. I want to know what it's about. And Jim McMahon, the year before, had just thrown for like over 4,000 yards, set like 80 some odd NCAA records. Mm. So he was just like, he was the man before I even got to campus. Yeah. And so I was really in awe of him. And he was such a cool guy to me. I remember the first couple of days I was there, he asked me to go golfing and we went and golfed. And, and so it, we had a good relationship. We probably have a better one now than yeah. we did back then. But uh, I just kind of liked watching the command of the offense that he had and the knowledge that he had when the coaches were talking to him. What's well, something you learned from Steve Young? Because let's be honest, Jim McMahon and Steve Young are like polar opposites of each other, it seems anyway. What was one thing you learned from him? Well, me and Steve were really good friends. Uh, I was a year behind him, and so we did a lot of things together. Uh, we golfed a lot. We hung out on campus a lot, and and uh, we just talked a lot about things. So I remember some of the things that I liked learning from him is I didn't grow up a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I figured once I got baptized at BYU, I figured I'll be speaking a lot if I became the starting quarterback. And so I spoke with him a few times and kind of got a little feel for that. And the bigger thing was interviews, how he treated the media, how he reacted to things. Mm -hmm. And I remember him and Gordon Hudson, after every, not every practice, but after a lot of practices, they would pull me aside. Okay, here we go. The lights are on, (laughs) camera rolling. And they would interview me. And I could not, I couldn't answer the questions. I'd be laughing and like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And so we did that over and over. And, you know, I think I learned a lot of things from Steve though, but uh, those things really stick out in my mind because they were outside of football, but they were a huge part of football and being at BYU. Right. You, uh, you seem like a really confident guy. I feel like to be a starting quarterback in division one football, you got to have a lot of confidence, but back then BYU still had a JV team. Did that help with your confidence to be able to start on that team first? Um, you know, I think I didn't really think too much about that because it was just kind of the way BYU did things. Yeah. I, I saw so many quarterbacks. They come in as a freshman. They play on the JV team. They redshirt. They back up. And they play for two years. So that was my goal. That's what I wanted to do. And so I came in as a freshman. I started on the JV team. I redshirted. I didn't redshirt right away. There were a couple games where they weren't sure if Steve was going to be the quarterback. Yeah. So I went to Georgia and was dressed just in case. Wow. And Steve throws five picks in the first half. Sorry, Steve. I have to tell the story. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, I might be playing as a sophomore. I don't, Secretly a little excited. like I don't know on. if I want to play at this time. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, then obviously Steve became one of the all-time greats yeah. at BYU, Hall of Fame, and the NFL, and everything like that. So it worked out great for him. So I was glad to see that. So after the second game, I redshirted. Then I backed up Steve, and then I started for the next two years. And I, I think my confidence came after the Baylor game, which was our second game. And that's where I really felt like very comfortable playing. You attempted 28 passes in 1983 as the backup to Steve. And then when 84 rolls around... Did you feel ready to be the starting quarterback? Like, were you like, I got this? I felt that way until I stepped on the field at Pitt. (laughs) You know, I felt like I can do this. I can do it. And it was my first three passes were probably the worst passes I threw in my career at Mm. BYU. And I overthrew a guy. He didn't even jump for it. It was so far over his head. I hit a guy in the back of the helmet, hit him in the back, and I walked off the field thinking to myself, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I should be the guy to play. And I remember Lavelle pulling me aside and talking to me about it and like, don't worry about things. You're going to be okay. Mm. And then it was the next game against Baylor, and I threw five touchdown passes in the first half, threw six for the game. And from that moment on, as an offense, we all had the swagger of that we were going to be pretty good. Then you became the Robbie Bosco that we all know and all love. 
When you look back at that season almost 40 years ago. Oh, no. <laughs> Lauren, don't 40 bring up those numbers. Ago, Robbie. <laughs> it's incredible, though, and I love that you're still here at BYU, by the way. But what stands out to you the most? When Because I feel like, even for me, last year, memories become a little fuzzy, right? But obviously, winning a national title is an incredible thing that will stick in your memory. But when you look back now, almost 40 years later, what stands out to you the most? Honestly, Lauren, it's my teammates. My teammates... I mean, I know I got a lot of credit and I got a lot of, you know, recognition and stuff like that. But without my teammates, none of this would have been possible. We had an amazing defense offensively. I had an amazing offensive line, great receivers, great running backs. Our special teams were really good. We just had a lot of great players on that team. And I was friends with all of them. It didn't matter. Um, all the, our special teams were so good. Most all these guys didn't start, but they became eventual starters at BYU at some time in their career, which means they were amazing football mm-hmm. players. I mean, we won a lot of games, and we won, we could have, in 84, we could have lost four or five games just as easily as we won them. Right. And so it was just talking about my teammates stepping up when they needed to step up, playing hurt. It didn't matter. It's like everything meant more for the team than individual mm. recognition. And we always felt, look, it, if we win, great things are going to happen to all, yeah. all of us. Yeah. And so that's probably the biggest thing. So cool. And you guys have all come so far since that time, almost 40 years ago. Yeah. And Robbie, BYU fans still hang their hat on that 84 national title from 38 years ago. It's sort of BYU fans' claim to fame. Are you okay with that? Or are there times you're like, all right, guys, let's, let's move on a little bit? I love it. <laughs> I do. I mean, look, it's it's something that we can talk about because it's a team. It was a yeah. team game, yeah. and it, our team did it. It wasn't like if somebody wants to talk about the all being an all American or coming in the Heisman twice. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. But this, we can talk about it forever because there's so many stories out there. I can talk about each individual person, and there's stories out there that are fun to listen to and, and fun to talk about. And, you know, there's probably been four or five kids on that team that have passed away now. Mm. And so our hearts go out to them and their families, but it's just, uh, I can live with this forever. And it's, it's fun to get with our teammates again and reminisce about the great things. I love that you get to do that. So cool. You had a, a stint in the NFL and then you came back to BYU. What made you want to come back to this university? Well, I needed a job, first of all. <laughs> when I, That's a good reason. When I came to BYU, I came to BYU to play in the NFL. That's just the bottom line. That's the honest truth. Uh, I wasn't much of a student, didn't think a lot about school, think about a future and that. I thought about going to the NFL and playing in there for 10, 12, 13 years, mm-hmm. whatever. And that would be my life. Right. And then get into something else if I wanted to, radio or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it just doesn't work like that. And I would never teach a young man to rely on a professional job. Right. Just because things happen. Right. And things did happen my senior year with my shoulder and I never came around. So when I got released from Green Bay, Mark Wilson was there with me, Mm. former BYU great. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mark. What do I do? Mm. I mean, I told him the story. I go, I didn't go to school to do this. I, right. I, I don't nothing to fall back on, really. Right. right. And um, he said, Garth Hall, who is a former running back coach at BYU, said he's looking for a quarterback coach. Mm. And this is in August now. So they've yeah. been practicing. Yeah. He goes, call him up. And I knew Garth well because he was a coach here when I was a player. I go, Garth, hey, I was just talking to Mark Wilson. And he said that you might be looking for a quarterback coach. And I think I'm done, yeah. you know, in the NFL. And he goes, Oh, heck yeah, come on out. <laughs> so they're, they're probably into spring ball or fall camp, three or four days, maybe even a week. I drive out there when I can get out there. He hands me the playbook. He goes, you're calling the plays. I'm like, oh what? My gosh. <laughs> so, I've never done that. I don't even know how to, to do it, be in a meeting right. with, you know, with coaches and stuff like that. So we didn't have a very good team. Anyways, I would talk to Lavelle here mm. and there, and I thought, you know what? It would be great to coach at BYU. Yeah. So I talked to Lavelle, and he wanted me to come back in the next year, which was 1989. And mm. he goes, go to graduate school. Be a graduate assistant. We'll pay for your school. So I got my master's. I was a graduate assistant. Some things happened, and they hired me in 1990, and then I've been here ever since. That's so awesome. So you obviously didn't necessarily see yourself as a coach because you saw yourself up as a player in the NFL. At what point in your coaching career were you like, okay, yeah, I can do this? 
Well, as soon as I was a graduate assistant, I fell in love with it. Mm. I mean, I, the, the, the hardest thing was when I was a graduate assistant, there were kids that were my teammates that were now seniors or even maybe a junior. So I wasn't out of it very long, and I knew a lot of the players. So that was a little bit weird yeah. and a little bit awkward. Right. But it still worked out. And when I was a graduate assistant, I, was, I loved it. I mean, I, I worked with some great coaches, Norm Chow, Lance Reynolds, Roger French. Man, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And so I got hired in 90 and we had a lot of great years until I retired, really. Played in the 80s, coached in the 90s, and you're still here in the 2020s. It's, <laughs> I love it. What, for you, when you look back, just kind of on the, the college landscape, what's one of the biggest differences that you've seen from back then till now? They're paying the players. <laughs> oh, that's true. Where was that when we all played? <laughs> How about... How about that? This NIL thing. I think so many things have changed, Lauren, and it's not frustrating because we didn't get it. It's just frustrating. Like, where do we come from? Yeah. Where are we now? I mean, college yeah. is always an amateur sport, right? And it's money has just changed everything. You know, good for those players that are getting deals and stuff like that. Uh, I kind of like the way BYU is doing it, where you know, when Built Bar came in, where everybody got a piece of the pie. Right. And there's some athletes that are getting a little bit more with right. different things. Right. But we're not getting paid some of those four or five million dollar deals that you read about, you know, in the paper and things like that. So I, I, I kind of like the way Kalani's doing it and uh, handling it. And that, that makes it more fun when everybody is kind of getting something involved. Absolutely. I love that as well. I know you probably don't play favorites and you probably actually have a lot of favorite guys that you've coached throughout the years. Do you have a favorite memory from your Years as quarterbacks coach of someone that you got to uh, coach. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, I coached a lot of great players, but, I mean, you can't really go much farther than Ty Detmer. Ty was a special individual and a very bright guy, and you could tell him something once, and he, he got it. Mm. He understood it. And there's others that I've coached where you had to talk about and repetition and right. go over and over and over. That and, would be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're that with out a there. lot of other guys, too. <laughs> but Ty was kind of special that way. And uh, watching him mm. perform and play, it just it brought back BYU football because we kind of lost it a couple years. Right. And weren't, I mean, we were good, but we just weren't the BYU style that we right. were. And then, uh, boy, we did a great job of uh, getting some good players and surrounding Ty. And Ty was just magical and made a lot of great things happen. And we you know, that's why he won the Heisman. Did you get as excited to start football as a coach as you did as a player? Or was it a, a different feeling? I was more excited to start as a coach really? than a player. Yeah, I mean, two-a-days with pads on and it's hot and you're scrimmaging and all that stuff is... Uh, football was never my sport either. Really? No, I mean, if, if I had to pick football in high school, it would have been my fourth favorite sport to what? play. What? Really? Basketball, oh my gosh. golf, baseball, and then football. I was, wow. not a, I was not a really tough guy and didn't <laughs> like to get hit and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I didn't play till I was a freshman in high school, tackle football, and I quit as a freshman. And then I went back on the team because they kept bugging me. They just wanted me to play because I was just naturally, yeah. I could throw a football. Right. And so then we had a super good team my junior year, and we went to the playoffs for the first time in I don't know how many years at Roseville High School. And then it's like, you know what? This is what's going to get me to a professional right. level. And so <laughs> oh I stuck gosh. with it, and uh, you know, it worked out pretty good. Didn't go as long as I wanted to, but but as a coach, you're just um, you're just excited because you're 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 meeting with them, and it's super fun to watch to teach something and see if those kids can perform what you're teaching them. And for me, early on in my career, at least, when they couldn't do that or they missed these receivers, you're like, I did that. Yeah. You can do it. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. And so that got frustrating at times. But, you know, you just, I got to remember, I'm getting older. Yeah. And, and these kids are always staying right around that right. same age. So, and they're doing the best they can. So, but it was super fun to coach. Oh, my gosh. That's fascinating. So, is that cool for you to be here and be able to be around, like, basketball and golf and all these other sports? and you were the golf coach for a while as well, weren't you? I did. I was an interim golf coach for the women's team. That's right. And the COVID year, I was interim men's tennis coach. Oh my gosh! Too. <laughs> you can do it all. So hey, it's the only one that I can have. You're three the Bo Jackson jobs. of BYU. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. I love it. 
What has you excited when you think about who's coming back for this year's football team? Wow, I mean, we have a lot of good players coming back. I mean, I, I know the offense. I'm sorry about this on the defensive side, but I know the offense a little bit better. I just, being an offensive guy, yeah. I just love watching yeah. the offense and watch how they do. But Jaron, I think, is going to be a special kid. And he's already proven that he can play. Now you add in intangibles from what he's learned over the last couple of years. Yeah. Reading coverages, knowing when, to, when you're taking off running, keeping your eyes downfield because somebody might be more open than you taking off. And he makes some really good decisions with that. Now, when he gets better, you know, he's going to start completing 65, 66% of his passes, which is really, really good yeah. in, in, in college football. And so I, I look forward to him. I think our receiving core is going to be good. Our running backs are going to be good. Our tight ends, our, our old line, they're giants out yeah. there. They're not only giants, but they're very athletic. And these guys are football players. They look super good. They don't look heavy. They just look, look like they're in great shape. And I'm just excited to watch them. And, you know, and our defense is going to get after it. I know they are, and I know they're going to be really a good team. And I look forward to this team. I think it's going to be a special year. With your position now, do you do you have an opportunity to kind of take Jaron aside and say A, B, C, and D? You know, just give him little bits of advice. I know that's hard because he has a quarterback's coach and there's other coaches, but do you get the opportunity to do that? You know what? I, I talk to I, – not really. Not really. And, and that's kind of a, a personal thing. I really don't go yeah. down there too much yeah. and interact. I became good friends when Taysom was playing. Yeah. And we would talk about some things. But – they got some great coaches. Aaron yeah. Roderick is a super, coach. super good coach and does a good job. I coached Aaron. Uh, <laughs> when I was a coach, Aaron was a graduate assistant. Mm. So I know what he knows, yeah. and I know what he's trying to do, and uh, he's doing a great job. So I just stand back. I stand back, and I love it because I love watching these guys. And I had my time, Lauren, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so there's no need for me to step in. And act like I know more than anybody else. So I just love watching them play. You get to be a fan now. Well, I that's love awesome. being a fan for sure. <laughs> Last question for you is what's it like for you being able to watch BYU make that jump into a Power Five conference into the Big 12? Oh, man, I just say about time. Yeah. I mean, we deserve it. We have, and, and, and I know football's the kingpin around here. Right. But when you look at our all around sports, we are an amazing athletic department. I think Tom Homo has done a tremendous job. He's the one that's led us to get to the Big 12. And he didn't make any hasty decisions. He kind of waited things out. And here we are. And it's going to be super fun. And it's going to be exciting. This year is going to be super fun, but it's going to be super exciting being in the Big 12. I think it's going to be awesome for our fans to see all these great teams come into Lavelle Edwards Stadium and, and play. And, and we just got to step it up. That's yeah. all there is to say about that. We've got to step it up with recruiting, with coaching, and all around our sports. We have to do it, and I think we'll be very successful. Probably makes your job a little more intense and difficult as well going to the Big 12. Is that right? That's, it always does. <laughs> anytime, anytime you step up as an athletic department, yeah. everybody yeah, around you have to step up for I sure. I love it. I'm talking to BYU Athletics Varsity Club Director and National Championship Quarterback Robbie Bosco. Robbie, thank you so much for coming on with me today and taking the time. Thanks, Lauren. Pleasure right. to be with you. Thank you. All right, a quick note before we end this episode of Cougar Tailgate. We're beginning our own version of fall camp on the show. For the month of August, we'll be working on our own conditioning and play calling and preparing for the season ahead. In all seriousness, the show is going through a few changes this month. We will have a brand new show the week before BYU football kicks off with South Florida on September 3rd. And we can't wait for you to join our Cougar Tailgate when it happens. So watch your podcast feed for a new Cougar Tailgate in about a month. And that does it for us today. Thanks again to Robbie Bosco for coming on the show with me. You can join Cougar Tailgate every Saturday at noon Mountain Time or download, rate, and review our podcast on Apple Tune and Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYUradio.org. This is Cougar Tailgate. <laughs>